Hello, everyone, and welcome to the How to Chess Podcast. I am Ben Johnson. I host the Perpetual Chess Podcast and happy to host the How to Chess Podcast brought to you by Chessable.com. And we have a special guest joining us for this episode. He is a beloved commentator, an author, a prolific Chessable course creator, including the Iron English, the Killer Dutch Rebooted, the Art of Attack in Chess. He is known to many as the Ginger GM, also known as Simon Williams. Simon, of course, is known for his attacking chess and his unwavering support of Harry the H-Pawn. And today we're going to tackle a question that is perfect for Simon to address, which is when to attack and when not to attack. So we'll be diving into that topic momentarily. But first, let's welcome Simon to the show. Simon, how's it going? It's going well, Ben. Uh, Thank you for the lovely introduction there. Um, Yeah, it sounds like I've been busy there with that introduction. So all good. And uh, it's it's nice to be uh, here with with your little section on how to attack. Thank you. Yeah, extremely busy pumping out the content. So we're privileged to have you join us. And without further ado, we're going to dive into my little list of questions. And one thing I want to say, um, but actually, before we we get to those questions, is just I've even noticed in my interactions with club players that they tend to have they tend to lean one way or the other. Basically, they either want to attack all the time to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail, or they're a little timid. So I think this is a great topic to sort of give some guidelines of how to have the proper balance that strong players like yourself often do, Simon, although you might tilt a little in the attacking side. (laughs) But anyway, without further ado, let's dive into the questions and let's start the clock. So Simon, let's just start off with general guidelines, a few tips of when might be a good time to attack. Yeah, but I think uh, a big mistake that a lot of people do, no, no matter really what strength, but lower down, is attacking when it's not the position does not demand you're able to attack. So you've got to build up foundations in any attack, so any position. So that means really positionally, you've got to have a strong position in order to have a successful attack. There's no point just wheeling out one or two pieces at your opponent's well-defended king because it's only going to fail. Um, so you've, you've really got to build up your position and positional chess is really important for attacking. So you've got to gain a better position normally in order to be successful. So you've got to have patience um, in order to attack. And one of the things I see a lot is people are trying to force it from move one uh, to get in there. And of course, there are lots of gambity lines you can play, which are absolutely fine. And, you know, I, I suggest some of these, but you've really can't always attack you've got to have the right position and you've got to build that position up first and other things to watch out for are you know just your development and do you have more developed pieces in your opponent and look out for any key weaknesses that your opponent might have so it's very hard to do a successful attack against a well-defended opponent's king but if his opponent if your opponent has moved his pieces away from his king he's got something a weak point around his king in the chessboard course art of attack i did uh I, it was called the focal point so like maybe the g7 square it is suddenly a bit weak or you know it's the pawns move forwards from g7 but the fianchetto bishop has disappeared the, these are the kind of things you've got to watch out for and that will help you decide what square to attack on and then you've got it's all about timing so it's building up the attack and uh noticing these weaknesses and timing it perfectly uh, so there's a lot of things to think about, um, but it, it really is a combination of positional chess first, which you've got to remember. So, Simon, that's great advice. Of course, uh, attacks are only likely to work if you have a solid positional footing uh, that, that you're um, basing them off of. Now, one other thing that I think comes into play when you're thinking about uh, when, whether to attack is how you're doing in the game. If you're up a lot of material, down a lot of material, how does that enter into the equation, Simon? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose there are different times when you attack. If you look, if you go back and look at how uh, attacking chess has really developed um, from the first strong players, and I'm going to say the first strong players, let's look at Paul Morphy. Um, Paul Morphy, when he attacked in his games, it was very risky. So his attacks were a little bit outrageous. And in modern day chess, they'd probably fail. Um, opponents are much better at defending, but in his time, he'd go all in. So he didn't have a, a stop, a stop really. But then I would say the next person who really revolutionized attacking was, and there were others, but it would be Alexander Alakine. And he's he's a great player to look at his attacks because he, he brought to chess 
the idea of um, really um, not, you know, building up that position. So uh, building up a good position or holding. And um, he, he would do it from mainly building up a center. So obviously with the white pieces, it's generally a lot easier to attack because you're in control and you can pick what kind of structure you want. And if you want to be a great attacking player, it's it's not really about the opening. The opening with any aspect of chess is just a way to get you into a game, into a position that you enjoy playing. So structures that you enjoy playing. When you're white, um, you should be able to pick structures that you enjoy. So you know you want this kind of position. I'm playing this opening to get to this position. And then if you know the attacking plans, you can dive in from that. And Alakine was brilliant at this. When he played D4, he would play very patiently. He could take control of the center and then he would attack in a risk-free manner. If it didn't work, he wouldn't lose. Um, so these kind of attacks are the best attacks when you build up your position and you do it very stably. And you can look at your pieces. You don't. You only sacrifice a piece. It was a very clear way of getting a result. So you don't. You're not really risking anything. Um, if we go forwards a little bit, then then another person to mention is uh, Macau Tao. You know, he, he was very speculative attacking, but brilliant. And to play in his way it is really hard. He would sacrifice a lot for the initiative, and the computers will always, always say. It, well, a lot of time his sacrifices weren't correct, but his sacrifices were very intuitive and they were really to gain the initiative. And you can often do this, even if you're not sure, just to gain the initiative. But you should, again, make sure that you have probably more pieces than your opponent attacking if you're doing it against the king. You can do a simple count. I have four pieces attacking my opponent's king. If he has maybe two or less, very good chance of being successful. So you can just count up your attackers, count up your opponent's defenders. And I suppose the other kind of attacking I should mention is, and a lot of club players, it seems, fail to do this, um, is a desperate a desperate attack or a desperate tactic. And that's when your position yeah. is slowly getting worse, Ben, right? It's getting worse and worse. And if you don't do anything, you're just going to lose. And I see so many club players, they don't know how to change the pace. Good top players, they can change the pace by suddenly doing something like an outrageous attack. It might fail, but you're not just going to lose without putting up a fight. You, you're, you're gambling a bit. So there's these various ways of doing it, but the, the Alakine one is, is the best way to do it, I guess. Yeah. If that Excellent. kind of makes sense. Great yeah. uh, history lessons there. Yeah, great history <laughs> lessons. And I love I love the idea of like, you, you do have to take more chances when you're in trouble. That's, that's where the yeah. equation alters, where you can kind of throw out the window, the solid positional footing um, and just be like, all right, well, I'm probably going to lose anyway. Now, Simon, so you've given some great advice for if you're trying to sort of ramp up your attack, but you also encounter or I also encounter the sort of swashbuckling club player they might emulate a player like yourself see you sacking all over the place and just try to do it in every situation if someone has that sort of disposition are there great players whose games they can study to try to sort of rein it in a little bit yeah i mean we've already mentioned alakine and um you know this art of attack course i did for chessball i think has some great examples of how to build things up the book is on chessball as well um I mean, modern day, every player knows how to attack. But I think a very important thing about attacking is defending. Because um, you, a lot of attackers, you, you've got to try to always assume your opponent's going to play the best defensive moves. So by looking at defenders, you'll learn how to attack better when they're going to be successful or not. Uh, I mean, nowadays, you know, all top players can do everything. But you look at Kasparov, obviously brilliant attacker. It, probably more in the way of using the initiative well. When he got the initiative, he, he was really relentless. That's another sort of form. He, you don't want to back down. When you start pushing, as soon as you lose that energy in the position, you're probably going to, your position is going to crumble. So look at how Kasparov uses the initiative. Um, and I, like I say, the, these these ways of building up, Alakine, I do mention. Um, and nowadays, just, um, well, you know, there's some, there's some very funky players, aren't there? Like Duboff, who... Um, plays very extreme stuff to confuse his um, high-rated opponents to to gain the initiative. Even if it's computer dubious, which a lot of his ideas are, it's more to gain that initiative and then to, again, be relentless in trying to push that through. So there's some names off the top of my head I can, I can sort of think of. 
Good stuff. Yeah. Um, Al and it's interesting that whether you attack too much or you attack too little, you can study his games to learn the proper pacing. And Dubov, of mm -hmm. course, is one of the most fun modern players. Uh, no, no argument there. Now, Simon, let's hear a little bit about Baby Ginger GM. When you were up and climbing the ranks, uh, I'm guessing you had an attacking instinct. What was your own development like in terms of uh, learning the, the proper pacing? Um, it's quite strange for, for, for me, actually. I, I, my play when I was a lot younger was quite positional. Um, I always loved attacking. I loved having the initiative. And I I'm, I think one thing you've got to remember at home, if you've got a choice to attack or not to attack, and it, you know, even if you're not sure it's sound, if you've got the right pieces there, it's often a good idea to do that because by creating threats, which you do when you're attacking, your opponent is under immediate pressure. So... Even if they can defend successfully, if you keep putting pressure on your opponent, they've got to keep finding the right moves. It's a lot harder to defend than attack. I mean, I learned the English opening and I learned all these positional principles probably before I started going a little bit crazy. So it's not like you can't be just one player. <laughs> you, you've got to have like a rounded game before you can do it. And um, I, I, I guess then, you know, I was just experimenting, trying out various different things and uh, it kind of developed from there, really. Excellent. Yeah. And it, it is it is amazing, Simon, how like you can find the life in any sort of opening, as you allude to. You can find a way to attack even in something like the English, which doesn't have that sort of fierce reputation. Well, Simon, I think we're out of time. So just want to thank you. It's been uh, some amazing insights on uh, on how to properly learn uh, when to attack and when not to attack. Thanks, Ben. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, good luck to everyone out there wants to hack up their opponent's king. So. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And we are back with the three chess improvement takeaways. Now, for number one, I was trying to remember a famous chess quote relating to the principle that Simon mentioned that if you're going to attack, you need a, a, a sound positional footing. And neither Simon nor I could track down that famous quote. So we're going to turn this into a contest. If anyone can find the famous chess quote, about chess attacks springing from a good positional setup. Um, it's by a former world champion, we're pretty sure. If the first person to leave the quote with attribution in the YouTube comments will win a free Art of Attack chessable course, of course, featuring Simon Williams. So we're going to throw that out there. But meanwhile, my number one improvement takeaway, as Simon says, <laughs> as Simon says, is um, to... Make sure you have the positional characteristics in place before you launch an attack, which brings us to takeaway number two, which is related, which is often your attack is a lot more likely to work if you have more attackers than your opponent has defenders in the neighborhood of the king. Um, I've heard a quote called the rule of two, basically meaning if you have two attack, two more attacking pieces than your opponent has defenders, an attack is more likely to, to succeed. You'll also see famous games of players like Kasparov, like Simon mentioned, where like there's just an uh, extra pieces on one side of the board and therefore Kasparov is able to just swap his opponent on the side where the king is. So definitely keep that in mind that the, the actual material isn't everything, it's the material around the king. Um, and last but not least, you could hear Simon when he talks about the legends of chess, how much work he's put in learning from players like Alyekin and Kasparov. So study the legends, Alyekin in particular, about ways to build up an attack and know when to pounce. But I did just want to throw in the caveat that if you're down material, you don't have to be on such a solid footing. It's okay to take a few more chances. So some great insights. Um, from Simon. And Simon, I understand that you have a quote to share before we uh, let you out of here. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we did mention that different players have different personalities. And even if we look at the world champions, some of them preferred attacking to the others. Some of the attacks were much more dubious than others. And uh, I think it was Botvinnik, who was a very sort of solid player, generally very well prepared, who said that if Tao sacrifices a piece, Take it. If I sacrifice a piece, think well and then decide. If Petrosian sacrifices a piece, resign. <laughs> and <laughs> I wonder which camp most of the viewers will be in at home, if they're going to be the Tau like, um, you know, sacrifices. But you do, if you're, it, you've got to sort of look at your own game as well. And the last thought I'd say is just look, if you're playing too solid, loosen up. 
if you're losing too many pieces, games through sacrificing, tighten up a little bit. It's just you've got to make that judgment as you know, as it's your own game. Okay, an excellent note to end on. So Simon, thanks again for joining How to Chess. Thanks. Thank you.